That's what you are. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Living Waters Fellowship. And for you that are online, welcome. You know, I know there's some things going on today. I think there's a Super Bowl game going on, and I'm sure there's some excited people here for that. I'm sure there's some excited people with grandchildren, birthdays. And I just want to encourage you to have that same type of excitement here this morning when we praise our God, our Savior. Amen? Let us rejoice and be so glad in the Lord. In spite of all the things that are going through in our lives, God knows it. So when we uh, stand and get ready to praise him, let us do it from the bottom of our heart. Because he is worthy of all praise in spite of what our flesh may say, what the world may say. I just want to see our hearts filled with the joy of the Lord. That we sing, make a joyful sound. I don't sing very well, but, you know, when the music's on, nobody can hear me. But I'm singing, and I just want to encourage each and every one of us to um, sing with a joyful heart. So, Heavenly Father, Lord, this is, this is your service, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place, Lord. Fill our hearts to overflowing, Lord. Let your love shine through us, Lord, that we would be your ambassadors, that we would walk according to your will. And I pray, Lord, that everyone here would feel your presence here, not just only this morning, but for the rest of their lives as they open up their hearts to your word and to your love. In Jesus' name, amen. So stand if you can, and uh, let's, let's worship the Lord. Super. 
God of creation, there at the start, before the beginning of time. With no point of reference, you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born in the vapor of your breath, the planets form. And if the stars amaze and worship so light, I can see your heart in it. Every burning star signal fire of grace. And if creation sings your praises, so will I. Chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. My 
on a hill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak a hundred billion fairies disappear we well, lost your life so I can find it here and if you left the grave behind you so alive I can see You dance over me while I am unaware. You sing all around, but I never hear the sound. Lord, I'm a
It's really amazing how much he loves us, right? It's like, wow, thank you, Lord, for your love. I wanted to read uh, Psalm 63 uh, to us this morning. Oh, God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and behold your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. They who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for the jackals. But the king will rejoice in God. All who swear by God's name will praise him, while the mouths of liars will be silenced. So, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you reign on high. I pray, Lord, you'll be with Pastor Dennis and Pastor Mike as they preach your truths today, Lord. Lord, Holy Spirit, work through them and around them. Cover them, Lord, that they would continue to speak your truths, Lord, and help us as a congregation to receive that truth, Lord, that we would not take offense because it's God's word, not theirs. They're speaking it in truth. Let us receive it in love. Let us receive it, Lord, with correction. Let us receive it joyfully into our hearts, Lord, that we would walk in your ways better than we did in 2021. 2022 is a new year, Lord, that you've given us. Help us, Lord, to walk in that truth. Help us, Lord, to walk with love with each other. And we give you all the praise and all the glory. And everyone said, Amen. So stand and greet if you can. Uh, We'll start the service in a couple minutes, but just say hello to a few people and greet everybody. For first-time people, welcome here to Living Waters Fellowship.
Good morning, church. Johnny's telling everybody to sit down. I welcome you to Living Waters Fellowship. We are a spiritual oasis in the middle of the desert, a place where God's healing waters flow. Our church is based on three pillars, evangelism, each one reach one, discipleship, building up the house of God in every person, and our mission is to make a difference in our community and world for Christ. If you're here for the first time, we give you a great big welcome. Uh, I was gone last week, so all the normal people were here then, so there's none here now. But uh, please, thank you. Thank you. I got to see lots of water. I got on the Oregon coast, so it was great. But thank you. Thank you for missing me. Oh. Hey, I might go away again and come back. Once a year? Oh, okay. My vacation time is over. We do have a biblical maxim we repeat together. Please join me. We are mighty men and women of valor because we are greater in the eyes of God than we are in our own eyes. And while our hearts may condemn us, God is greater than our hearts and knows what truly lies within. Taken from Judges 6 and 1 John 3. We'd remind you to please turn off your cell phones and if our ushers would come forward, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your many blessings. Father, you just cover us with everything we need. And we just ask that you bless the tithes and offerings we give back to you, Father to be used to spread your word, Father, here in our community and around the world. Amen. If you're watching from home uh, and want to be blessed and send a tithe, you can do it to our street address, 211 West 1st South, Suite C, Mesquite, 89027. We have a box number, 3294. That zip code is 89127. Excuse me, 89127. And as always, please visit our webpage at mesquitelivingwaters.com. Please remember, we always have a prayer team after the service that is up here, and uh, we would be honored to pray over you uh, for your needs as well as if you want to stand in the gap for someone else. Wednesday night, we have our prayer studies. We have a women's Bible study. We're going through John's New Testament letters, and the men's Bible study is a special study from Promise Keepers, and both those are Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. This Thursday night, we have corporate worship. James, did you want to say something about prayer? Uh, yeah, corporate praise and prayer this Thursday at 6 o'clock, about an hour, give or take, 15, 20 minutes, depending on how everyone feels led by the Holy Spirit. But I want to um, have Moose come up here. He asked me to invite him up here. I have no idea what he's going to say. So, um, but Holy Spirit's been upon him, so we'll just, uh, <laughs> we'll just let it go. Okay, Moose, settle down, settle down, I tell you. It's a tough crowd. Amen, it's a tough crowd. You know, before we, begin, before we begin this, I'm going to ask you to join me in a prayer, okay? I need it. When you get old, you got to do this. I want to have you join me in the first verses of a song that is so important. It's, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to thee, Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. If you're at home, stretch your hands forward. For those of you, I'm not going to ask you to rise, but I'm going to ask you to join me in song. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Amen. Beautiful. For those of you that know me and have seen what's been happening over the last month, 
There's been a huge change, and of course you know that Marilyn and I have been called to serve God in a ministry. Corporate prayer, is there's two types of prayer. Our personal prayer with our Father, when we go home, when we're on our knees, when, our, when we're praying alone, that's, that's our personal prayer. That's our time, and it's expected of you and me. But there's corporate prayer. This past month, since January 20th, I've been involved with corporate prayer probably two to three times a week, morning and evening, with pastors and leaders all across America from all 50 states. There is a movement, and the Holy Spirit is pressing down. He is pressing down on you at home and everyone here. You've got to feel it. If you can't see it or hear it in my voice, God is calling. The harvest is ready. It's ripe. Our Lord and Savior is going to come, and that trumpet's going to sound. And the reason I'm saying, talking to you about corporate prayer is we need to join together in corporate prayer. We need to come together as a family. Put our differences aside. There's no room for politics. There's no room for theological differences. We are one body in Christ, and we need to bind together and stand together as warriors, and that's what corporate prayer is about. It's a healing for our church. It's a healing for our nation, and it is a, it's a shield that God has given you. Join us in corporate prayer. If you don't see me here, don't worry. I will be here as soon as I can. My wife and I are heavily involved in, in prayer and courses, and sometimes that means on Thursday night I am with uh, those that are training me. So God bless you, and I expect to see you here. Come pray with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Moose. Uh, women, the Women's Koinia is this coming Saturday. Um, Nine o'clock, we'll have some fun food and fellowship, so please come out this Saturday. There's uh, more information on the table and also a sign-up sheet for food if you would like to help with that. Tonight's Sunday night service is Hallmark of Authentic Ministry. Uh, we're in First Thessalonians tonight at 6. Uh, next Sunday night is the Sunday night movie. That's also at 6, so there was a flyer in your bulletins, and you can come out for that. Um, Today, we're having a special potluck, so stay after church. Uh, even if you didn't bring anything, Lord provides. Stay and have some time to um, just chat, fellowship, and uh, catch up with every, what everybody's been going and doing, and I'll show you pictures. Hey, there you go of my vacation. <laughs> Let's bore you all to death. I would like to say we have a couple of Valentine baby birthdays. Carol's trying to hide back there in the corner is one, and Chris is around here somewhere. He's probably taking care of the money, but all of you just, uh, when you see him in the hall, wish them a happy Valentine's Day birthday. They get extra love this year. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this glorious day. We're privileged to be in your house, Father, to worship you without fear of repercussion and just, just Relish in your love for us, Father, the most wonderful love we could ever have, Father, on any day, whether Valentine's Day or not. And I just so thank you for that, Father. We just lift up Pastor Dennis and Pastor Mike to you, Father, with the time they have spent seeking your face, Father, hearing from you. And we give you all the praise and glory. We ask you to anoint our time today, bless our food and our fellowship after the service. And just be with us, Father. There is a word for each of us. Open our ears so we can hear that and take it forth. Amen. Amen. Well, you, you got hired again. Oh. <laughs> How quickly they turn on me up here. I'll tell you something. Do it one week and now they're cheering. Hello. Um, I'm going to ask Pastor Mike if he would come forward, but as he's coming forward, how about what we do normally? Good morning, family. Good morning. How y'all doing today? Are you ready for a Super Sunday? Notice I didn't say Super Bowl Sunday. Are you ready for a Super Sunday? Yes. 
Are you ready for a Super Sunday? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. That's the mic. Good morning, church. Good morning. Are you excited to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah. Amen. It's always exciting to look forward to joining with all of you on Sunday mornings. Well, as you notice on the screen, we have something concerning a conference. And um, I just want to let you know, a, a number of weeks ago, God had just begun burdening my heart and giving me a vision um, to what I believe is this heart. And uh, it's about giving us as Christians hope in these times that we're living in. Uh, if you haven't joined us on Sunday nights, on Sunday nights, we've uh, been going through the Word of God. Now we're in Thessalonians. And as we begin to go through that, we're going to be going through some scriptures concerning the end times. Uh, and if you're not interested, I just want to say you need to wake up, church, because um, the days are, are growing short. And um, so what has happened is God has um, orchestrated, I guess is the best way I can say, uh, us to have the opportunity to host a live stream telecasts for this conference. I know many of you don't know who these faces are up there, but I'll explain in a moment. Uh, this event is going to be two weeks from yesterday, which is February 26th. And I know it's early, uh, 7, 7 a.m. in the morning. I know you're just probably getting the sand out. But uh, the reason for that is, is it's taking place in Oklahoma at March Hitchcock's church, and they're two hours ahead. So don't let that scare you. Um, I want to invite you to come and join us for this live stream telecast from Faith Bible Church in Edmonton, Oklahoma. And uh, there are five well-known senior pastors and uh, ministry founders uh, the first one is Jack Hibbs. He's the guy right in the center. I don't know how many of you know who Jack Hibbs is. Didn't think so. Okay. Probably count him on one hand. Jack Hibbs is a uh, senior pastor from California, from uh, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, who has a, a following of millions of people all over the world. Um, he's um, a great Bible teacher and prophecy um, is his forte. He's going to be there. He's a verse by verse expositional Bible teacher. Also, where that's going to be held at is another pastor by the name of Dr. Mark Hitchcock. He is the gentleman on the right next to the guy in the center. Uh, he's the senior pastor of a Bible, a Bible Faith Church. He's an associate professor of Bible exposition at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary. So these guys are not just somebody that's out there that people haven't never heard of. Uh, the third fellow is a senior pastor, Philip DeCourcy of Kindred Community Church. He's a dynamic speaker uh, on a national media program uh, entitled Know the Truth. And then there's Jack Kinley, the founder of Main Thing Ministries. I had never heard of this guy. And... Uh, Mind you, I investigate before I start promoting anything. So uh, these guys are all solid Bible teachers. And the fifth person that I want to point out is Amir Tasafati. Uh, I hack his name up, Tasafarti. Um, and when he says his name, it'll be totally different. But he, <laughs> he's a, a born-again believer that was born in Jerusalem. He served in the military over there. And this guy is phenomenal. Uh, if you've never heard of him before, if you want to know what's going on in the Middle East and Israel with all this going on with Russia and Iran, and this is the guy to follow on Telegram or his YouTube channel. But he doesn't share things on YouTube because YouTube does what they do. Uh, so I would suggest that you follow him on another uh, format. So let me say this. We, we know there's a lot of chaos and confusion in our world right now. Amen? Can we all agree on that? 
a lot of fear, uncertainty, amen, in our whole world today. And what will happen at this conference is we will hear uh, from God through his word from these men of God. And I can promise you, I can guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. We're asking a $5 donation. Come early. We're going to open up at 6 o'clock. We're going to have refreshments in the morning to help wake you up, you know. We'll just put an IV in your arm for some coffee and some other condiments. And then we'll break when they break from 9.30 to 11.30. Again, I apologize about the time. It's a weird time to break for lunch for us, but during for two-hour break that they have over there, we'll break, we'll fellowship, and then we'll eat together, and then we'll come back for the last four hours. Believe me, this 7 o'clock to 3.30, our time, will not be a waste of your time. I believe that you will thank God for these men that have a word, I believe, for every one of us. Uh, we've extended the invitation to the churches in the community. Also, as I close up right now, I just want to ask you, if you want to come, let me know. We're asking just $5 as a donation. If you can give more, then praise the Lord. That's going to help pay for uh, the telecast has been paid for, uh, but for the food. And so I just want to invite you. I'll hope to see you there February 26th. Amen, church? No, I preach this morning. I wish I could. <laughs> Pastor Mike was up here. Our preaching has been done, so I guess I just kind of... Yeah, in closing, let me say the prayer. Let's go to the slide going into what we're doing. Seeing that tomorrow is Valentine's Day, um, over the past 25 plus years, uh, I've always done a message prior to Valentine's Day on the love that God has for us or our love toward God. Um, and then in 2020, as we went through this, this beginning of this uh, COVID thing, um, I did a series on faith, hope, and love. Actually, a series on each one of those words when it says, um, basically, after all this is said and done, all that remains now is faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So I did a series on love as well. And just to let you know, I have done a whole lot of different teachings on this particular topic. And so I was sitting there thinking, okay, Dennis, what, what could I possibly talk about, about this issue of love that I haven't covered in the past 25 plus odd years? And I was going, you know, what, what, what do you want me to do? And what could I bring forth that would be new and that could expand our understanding on this important quality of love? And then I realized it was kind of like the Lord said, you haven't taken it to the next level. You haven't taken the next step in it, Dennis. And that is, I've never looked at it at the perspective that Paul talks about in his letter to the Ephesian church. And so I'd like to share with you what I, you know, as I walked into this, what I saw as the absolute immensity of God's love for us. Now, prior to our verse in Ephesians chapter 3, the beginning part of Ephesians chapter 3, Paul is telling the church there not to lose heart. And that's because he is praying for them. He is praying that Jesus would dwell within their hearts through faith so that they can be rooted and grounded in God's love for them. But the question is, why would he be speaking this to the church? They already know Jesus. They already love him. Why was he saying something like this? Well, I think that's what Paul is saying about in our verse. He goes on to explain and that's what we're going to study today. And so let's look at this verse. Let's just get right into it. And he's saying so that they may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now, our first take at this, whenever we look at this particular passage, with well, commentators, I've read commentators and talked to people, the first thing they always go to is what? Is these four dimensions. 
talking about the love of Christ. Absolutely, 100%. The all-encompassing love of God is found in those four words, the, these four dimensions. But Paul actually begins with some pretty strong words as to why this is so important for us to learn. Why is something like this important for us to take in? We already know Jesus, or those of those believers, we already know Jesus. We already love him. What, what? You know, let's go to have something to eat, Dennis. Come on, there's, there's food out there. But let me just say, he begins by saying something that is absolutely should grab our attention as to why this is important. And there's five words. He says, may be able to comprehend. That's huge and should be understood in its entirety. We pass over that, but let me tell you, let's stop passing over that. Because this particular phrase, may be able, let's just say, make be able, those three words in the Greek language come from two Greek words. Ik, or ek, which is from out of, and iso, which is being strong. Now, in the Greek language, these two words, when they're combined together, is one of the strongest words for strength that is known. And so what this is signifying is this, is that we are fully able and capable of understanding, doing, and experiencing what is being talked about. And then he goes in to comprehend. To comprehend, I mean, that basically means to eagerly seize, in the Greek language, to easily take or to seize something and make it your own. You know what you, how you get when you get want something? Mine. That's, that's the children, right? Y'all have had kids, right? Yeah. What's the first thing? Mine! <laughs> and that's what that basically means. Mine! This is mine. This is, I'm going to hold on to this because this is for me, he's saying. And so this is something we need to understand. It's to gain control of something. And it gives an idea of grasping something as to comprehend intellectually. We need to know this intellectually. And I'll get into that more because the word for knowledge there is the word gnosis, which means knowledge, intellectual. So understanding these five words just a little bit may bring out what the Amplified Bible says. You know, it says something in the Amplified Bible that kind of expands the understanding of it. But here, I, now we're going to better understand why he's doing it. The Amplified Bible translates this this way, that you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp. This is how important this is. He said, I need you to have that power to grasp what I'm about to tell you. You need power to grasp hold of and make it your own. This love of Jesus Christ, the amount, this, this unbelievable expanse of God's love for you. Therefore, to grasp the full significance of what Paul is saying, he was generally concerned for them there in Ephesus. Even though they're a church, even though they believed in Jesus, he was concerned for them that they don't miss Christ's love for them, and so that we today, we don't miss and the amount of Christ's love for us as well. And then we need to what? Lay hold of it. And I'm going to say it this way. We need to lay hold of its vast expanses. And we need to now live a supernatural life within these four dimensions of God's love. We see a similar principle of what I've talked about, maybe able to comprehend. We see a similar principle uh, in Joshua chapter 1, verse 3 where the Lord tells to Joshua these words. He says, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, as I said to Moses. In other words, God had already promised it to him. It was theirs. But still, Joshua and the people had the responsibility, to say it that way, or to, they needed to obey the Lord God in order to make it their own, to apprehend it, to grasp it. This land was already theirs, right? God already promised it to them, but they still had to enter into it. They had to follow what God told them to do in order to make it their own. And that's the same principle for us today. Now, the reason this is so important for us to lay hold of this truth about the immensity of God's love and not to let go of it is because we live in a world. I mean, the whole, I mean just think about it. We, we, we live in the, with a whole generation, a whole world that does not know they don't know. They haven't comprehended. They haven't yet grasped the totality of God's love for them. Or as Paul states, they don't know the love of Christ that surpasses everything that humanity can ever think of when it comes to this word love. 
Humanity's got all these definitions and everything else out there. I mean, Valentine's Day, love. All, the, all these gifts, all these presents. Chocolates, chocolates. I love chocolates. Chocolates. But we don't understand what it means. And he's saying, you guys have got to grasp this meaning. Again, why is this important? It's because of what the Lord said through the prophet Hosea. And he makes it abundantly clear. He says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected, he's saying, knowledge. What it seems like is that the Ephesian church hadn't considered, nor had they grasped the hold of the intensity of God's love for them. The immensity of it. They hadn't grasped hold of it yet. A love that is rich in mercy and a rich in grace. The Apostle Paul brings this out earlier in his letter in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Look what it says. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, which, which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And then Paul goes on to say that because of God's great love for them, he is now, in verses 6 and 7, he says, he has raised us up together. That's important to understand. We'll get to that in a second. But look at that. He has raised us up together. He has made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. It also is a love that describes the very nature and character of Jesus. We see this as he went through the humiliation that he went through there upon the cross as he suffered and died for us. In his letter to the Philippian church, Philippians 2.8, Paul said this, And being found, that is Jesus, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. We see this very same thing about the coming Messiah as that suffering servant through the prophet um, Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, verse 3, he said that Jesus was despised, or the Messiah was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth, in 2 Corinthians 8, 9, he talks about how they knew the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, he became poor for our sakes. And he says that you, that is us, through his poverty, might become rich. That's what Jesus did. He became poor so that we could become rich, so that we have a, could have eternal life. Therefore, we are then to know the love of Christ for us and how we have been delivered, how we have been delivered from guilt and the curse of the law, which is sin and death, thus eternal death. And instead, what he has given to us, he has given to us his love, also his peace, holiness, and eternal life in heaven. That's the exchange. And so now do you understand why it makes sense as to why this is so important? To understand, to understand for humanity, to grasp hold of Christ's unbelievable and incomprehensible love for them and for us as well. But understand this. This is not a solitary, individualistic pursuit. See, that's our problem. We see that, we, that we, this is something that we need to do by ourselves in our own private prayer closet. And yes, we should, but that's not what he's saying here, is it? He's saying it's not solitary, it's not individualistic. Rather, we are to do it with all the saints, Paul said. We are to study, discuss, share, observe the love of Jesus Christ in community, one with another, with other believers. And that's where I said in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, what he says is that how God has raised us up, what? Together. And how we sit together in the heavenlies. We do this together, folks. We do this together. It's not something that we do outside. Well, I can, I, I can worship God in the, in, in the forest. Well, we don't have forests around here. I can worship God in the desert. I don't need church. That's the mantra anymore. I don't need church. They have no idea the fact that the church is what Jesus did. Jesus is the one who said church is what, he's the one who's the head of it. He gave us the church. He gave us one another so that we can grow in that love and in that faith. One with another. That's the purpose of this. And so this actually goes along with what the writer of Hebrews says as well. He says that he gives this admonition that as believers we are not to forsake our assembling together with other believers, which seems to be not only what was happening back then, but it's happening as well today. 
but we need to do it even more so. Pastor Mike was bringing that out. We need to do it even more so. Why? We need to exhort one another. We need to encourage one another. Why? Because the days are getting short. And the day of the Lord is at hand. So that's why we need to continue to come together and to, and to get that encouragement and to, and to exhort one another as these days are going through. And so Paul in our passage is therefore praying that we might better grasp and experience Christ's immense love for us in fellowship with the church and with one another. That has been missed in almost every commentary I've ever read. We can't get to part B until we get part A down. It's amazing how we want to skip ahead, isn't it? Oh, well, I want to know more about the breadth and the, and the length and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the depth and the height of Christ's love for me. Yes, but you have to understand that we do it together. And we need to grasp it now. I can get off on this. So what are the four dimensions Paul uses to describe this unfathomable love? that he has for us. Well, the first one is breath. That's B-R-E-A-D-T-H. Not breath, but breath. That is with. Another way to say that is with. In other words, as far as the east is from the west, from one side to another. That's an enormous expanse. Why? Because it never comes back together. It continues to expand and continues to expand. It expands, it's, it's unbelievable. And so it means full of width, or uh, it's comprehensive. In other words, uh, his love is comprehensive in nature. And D Jesus describes this love as wide enough to embrace the entire world. And probably the best known scripture out there in the New Testament. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus loves everyone not just some, as some certain doctrines put out there, actually. He loves everyone, not just the elect, as some doctrines talk about. And that's important to understand. The comprehensive love that he has given to us. Jesus, that's what he said in John 3, 16, for God so loved what? The world. Not only are certain people in the world. He loved the whole world. That whosoever, not just the elect, but whosoever believes in him. Jesus died for everyone, including you and me. He, climbed, he died for everyone. If his death was only for a few and not for all, what does that mean? That means that Paul was speaking a lie. And Jesus was speaking a lie. If we say that it's only for the elect, and that's, I, I, that's something I, I, I don't usually like to discuss doctrine, but that's something I'll stand on. He died for everyone. And his love is, is, covers everyone. Everyone needs the love of Christ because we are all guilty before a holy and righteous God. We are miserable, condemned, and perishing. That's the way I was. But Jesus took on our sin. He took upon our death. He took upon the sin and death of everyone. And I love the way uh, the prophet Isaiah says this, again, going back to the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. He says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, that is the Messiah, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Notice the word all begins and ends that passage. All. Is there anything outside of all? All is all. Isn't it? Everybody, the width of God's love. Everyone. Now we get to the length. Length means that there's no starting point and there's no ending point. It just keeps on going. It speaks of the durability of God's love. It just keeps on going. I know I don't care about the Energizer Bunny. He's got nothing over the love of Jesus. That energizer bunny, you're still going to need it in the battery. Not Jesus and not his love. The love of Jesus Christ is, it precedes the world's existence and it's going to also last beyond the end of time. Therefore, the love of Christ is a love that's long enough to last forever. In other words, it is eternal. 
His love is eternal. 18th century pastor Charles Spurgeon, he said something about this passage and specifically about this dimension. He said this, It is so long that your old age cannot wear it out. It's so long that your continual tribulation cannot exhaust it. Your successive, your successive temptations shall not drain it dry. Like eternity itself, it knows no bounds. In his first letter to the Corinthian church, Paul, in what is known as the love chapter, in 1 Corinthians 13.8, he says this, but love never fails. Guys, love never fails. That word never is a huge word. It never fails. It cannot fail. No possibility of failing. There's not a 99% that it will and 1% it won't. God's love never fails. And he goes on to say, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. But then I go back to the beginning. But love never fails. And so the length of God's love for us is beyond everything else. The third dimension is depth. Death means something that is far deeper than what we can see on the surface. You ever thought, heard about the bottomless pit? And we're not talking about my stomach. But you know the bottomless pit? You know why they call it a bottomless pit? Because you can't see it. You see, basically, there's nothing. <laughs> and I love the idea that Jesus, you know, the bottomless, Jesus, he, <laughs> there's nothing too deep that he can't go and rescue us from. Uh, probably the best way I could say that. He reaches to the lowest depths to reach the lowest sinner. He reached down and got me. To the church in Philippi, again, I'm going to go back to Philippians 2.8. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. I like what Corey Ten Boom says. She said it this way. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. <laughs> Jesus, in his love for us, stooped down. He came to this earth for the worst of the worst, for those who hate and rebelled against the Lord God, to those who basically, um, the Bible calls them children of wrath. In other words, he stooped down, came down to this earth for you and me. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians, again going back to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. He said, and you he made alive, God bless you, and you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we have all conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. And Jesus reached down to us, and he pulls us up. Jesus went to the depths in order to lift us up to the next dimension, to the heights. That's the fourth dimension here. Height means elevation. It's a love that is high enough to take sinners to heaven through belief in Jesus Christ. Christ's love conveys to, all, to us all the blessings of heaven itself. It raises fallen humanity and transforms us into the likeness of Jesus Christ by faith. Not to mention, we are now children of God and if children of God, then heirs of his heavenly kingdom. To the last day's church, the church of Laodicea, Jesus said this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I'll grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And so the height of God's or Christ's love for us is that he saves us in order to be with him in heaven in the presence, in his presence for all eternity. Therefore, from what we've seen, and what Paul talks about throughout the book of Ephesians is the full extent of Jesus' love for us. That is, it's wide enough to reach this entire world and beyond. It's long enough to stretch into eternity. 
It's deep enough to rescue people from sin, Satan, and an eternity in hell. And it's high enough to raise all who believe into heaven itself in the presence of God. And so what these dimensions describe for me is an infinite, incomprehensible love that God has for us. We can't plumb its death depths. We can't reach its height. I mean, we can't even comprehend, you know, the magnitude of its width or its length. The measurements that Paul gives to us um, shows us the immensity of Christ's love. You can go as far left or right as you want to, go as far forward or backward or up and down, as far as you can, and you're never going to explore, and you haven't explored all there is to know about the love of Jesus Christ. How far can you go? It's still not enough. No matter how much we know of the love of Christ and how fully we enter into his love, there's always more to know. There's always more to experience. I love the way Tozier says this when he was working through this, um, this section. He said, because God is self-sufficient, his love had no beginning. Because he is eternal, his love has no end. Because he is infinite, his love has no limit. Because he is holy, his love is the quintessential of all spotless purity. Because he is immense, his love is an incomprehensibly vast, bottomless, shoreless sea. Oh, my goodness. I had to really think about how vast that is. No shores. It's vast. It's, it's, there's no bottom to it. That's his love for us. And so in our passage, Paul is describing something that is bigger than anything we could ever possibly know. He is speaking that which is bigger than the breadth, length, height, and depth of God's plans and purposes, not only for the nation of Israel, but he's talking now about going into the new covenant, and that is of Christ's love for us, how he gave his life for us. Paul is speaking about the love of God, the, how the love of God is shown through Jesus Christ. He's speaking how God has taken us who were undeserving and spiritually dead and has forgiven our sins. He's adopted us as his children, raised us to new life, and has given us an eternal home in heaven. And so if these are the four dimensions which, Christ, which describes the love of Christ, what this is telling me is that this is beyond each one of us. Why do I say that? It's because we're living in a universe whose width, length, height, and depth continues to expand. It's continuing to expand. And he's saying that God's love, Christ's love, is greater than that. So for me, when I thought about that, we have the four dimensions here. But for me, love is the fifth dimension. It's outside of the other four. And it's always expanding beyond the other four. That's God's love for us. That's the immensity of God's love for us. And it's actually found in the next part of our verse where it says this in 19, the first part of verse 19, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. The word love is in the Greek language here is the word agape, which means unconditional, sacrificial love. It's a love that is evident in what Jesus did for us as he went to the cross in order to die for us. He died for our sins so that we could have eternal life with him. The word for passes here might be better interpreted as surpasses. In other words, it passes knowledge. In other words, it goes beyond knowledge. Whatever knowledge we have, God's love, Jesus, the love of Christ, goes beyond that knowledge. So it surpasses knowledge. And I love that. It surpasses knowledge. The Greek language, it expresses something that is beyond comparison. And when I thought about that, I thought of other aspects about Jesus Christ that Paul talks about. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, he talked about the surpassing greatness of his glory. In uh, Ephesians 1.19, the surpassing greatness of his power. In Ephesians 2.7, the surpassing riches of his grace. But here in our passage, the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. Now the word for knowledge is the word gnosis, which means intellectual. And so to surpass that which we know intellectually would indicate this, that it's beyond our ability to know it and to understand it. Not only is it beyond our ability to understand it, but it's also beyond our ability to experience its fullness. 
we haven't even plumbed the depths of his love for us yet. Think about how much he's loved us and we haven't even gotten close to it. And so we can never exhaust our knowledge of the love of Christ for our lives, which goes along with this ever-expanding dimensions that we talked about. And then he ends by saying that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The word that for may be filled means to be filled to the brim. I don't know about you, but I've never filled anything to the brim. I've always gone over. And that's how I feel is about this one, and that it's overflowing. And that goes along with our four dimensions, doesn't it? How this filling that God is giving to us is expanding within us. I see this fullness of Christ in us to where Paul said in his letter to the Colossian church, Colossians 2.10, you have come to fullness of life in him. In other words, our life is continually expanding in him even now and it will continue to expand in him until we're in his presence in heaven. To him who is the head of all rule and authority, he says. And then there's what the Apostle John said about Jesus. He said, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. But verse 16 says it this way, and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace. Basically, it means grace upon grace. In other words, grace continues toward us. Nothing stops God's grace. It continues. It's ever expanding in our life. It's His grace. And if I could, I'd like to end with these words, and that is, and, and stay with me on this one, because you might go, what? We can never be filled to fullness. We can never be filled to fullness. Why? Because our spirits are not contained in these bodies. Our spirits are ever expanding. They're ever expanding with the love of Christ for us. And that's what he wants you to know. He loves you so much. And he wants to give you all of his love. And he wants you to experience the whole of his love. And that's going to continue until we're in his presence. And then we're going to be filled to fullness. I can't wait for that time. And so that's the immensity of God's love for us. That's the immensity of Christ's love for us. And I hope that this Valentine's Day, although we love to give gifts and everything else, I want you to think about this great gift of love that God gave to you in His Son, Jesus Christ. I wonder what gift could we give? You know, we all receive gifts and everything else, the chocolates and the flowers and all that kind of stuff, mm, teddy bears. Y'all know what I'm talking about. God gave to us the greatest gift of them all, and that is His Son. What can we give back to Him? Our hearts, the whole of who we are. We are to be what the Bible says, those living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to Him, which is our reasonable act of worship. That's what we can give to Him. Will you bow your heads with me, Father? Lord, I thank you for the wonderful gift that you have given to us in your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for coming down to this earth for the specific purpose of dying for us so that we could be made right with you, so that our sins could be forgiven, and so that we could have that new life with heaven as our home. And so, Lord, I ask that you would just help us to understand, to grasp hold of this love that you have shown to us. And, Lord, may we truly keep that great commandment, and that is to love you with the whole of who we are, love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. And then to love one another as you have loved us. And so, Lord, thank you for giving us this opportunity to look into your word and to see the immensity of your love toward us. And as I ask in Jesus' name, amen. There's a song that I'd like for us to sing as we go out. And I just heard the song again on Wednesday.
song that I hadn't heard uh, probably almost 20 plus years. It's a worship song that is absolutely gorgeous. I heard it. I started crying. It's about the love of God. Amen. And it's called Knowing Jesus. Would you stand, please, as we take this opportunity and, and just let's sing this as a worship to him. that that would truly be our prayer that we would know you more know more of your love know more of your grace and mercy for us 
And so, Lord, I ask that you would just strengthen each and every one of us here today. And may your grace and your mercy abound in each. And this I ask in the greatest name of all names, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We've got prayer people down here. and Thank you, Pastor Dan. Um, hello? Well, I don't, know say that. I don't normally do this, but I just really felt the Holy Spirit's here. When Pastor Dennis was saying, Revelation 3, 20, 21, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father. And the, and, the, and the sense I was getting was that if there's anyone here that needs to overcome anything, I'd like to pray right now. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I got both of my hands up because I need to overcome. So if you could bow your heads, and if this is your heart, I want you to raise your hand to God. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the message here this morning. And Lord, I ask, Lord, that you would help each one of us that has their hand raised to overcome whatever is preventing them to love you with all their heart, soul, and mind, and strength, Heavenly Father. I ask you, Lord, that you would help us to overcome evil, that you would help us to overcome, Lord, those obstacles that keep tripping us up. I ask you, Lord, to help us to overcome those things, those addictions that prevent us from loving you. I ask, Lord, to help us to overcome our fear with your love. I ask, us, I ask you, Lord, to overcome our hate. I ask you to overcome, Lord, those things that prevent us from being all that you have for us, Lord. When I read that, I said, oh, Lord, that he would grant you to sit with him on his throne because he overcame. So, Lord, I ask this in Jesus' mighty name, Lord, because we can't do it on our own. Help us, Lord, to overcome. And each one of us knows, Lord, in their heart what they're going through and what they need to overcome. And I thank you in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. If you do need prayer, please come on forward. We have our prayer team up here. But if not, make your way in. Got a lot of food over there. I don't want to give it to Moose. So, guys, go. Don't you move. <laughs>